The technological progress of humanity is always tied to our ability to harness energy. For our early history, we had to make do with only our bodies, but eventually we learned how to harness fire and then fossil fuels, and most recently, we learned to split atoms. Never before had we had such energy at our fingertips, but this came with immense danger. As such, sources of radioactivity must be operated with under the most stringent safety protocols and regulated regulations on the planet. However, as history has proven, even in this regulated environment, things can still go catastrophically wrong. But what happens when radioactive sources is removed from the influence and gaze of these regulatory bodies? They become orphan sources. The United States Nuclear Regulatory Commission defines an orphan source as, quote, a sealed source of radioactive material contained in a small volume, but not radioactively contaminated soils or bulk metals, in any one or more of the following conditions. In an uncontrolled condition that requires removal in order to protect the public health and safety from a radiological threat, controlled or uncontrolled, but for which a responsible party cannot be readily identified, controlled, but the materials the material's continued safety cannot be assured. If held by a licensee, the licensee has few or no options for, or is incapable of providing for, the safe disposition of the material. And finally, in the possession of a person not licensed to possess the material who did not seek to possess the material. End quote. Most orphan sources do begin their lives legitimately under the watch of government regulation. They are usually small radioactive sources used for things like radiography, radiotherapy, or generating electricity in the form of radioisotope thermoelectric generators, or RTGs. These things are essentially nuclear batteries that harness the decay heat of radioactive material to generate electricity. To become an orphan source, these sources are either then abandoned, lost, misplaced, or stolen in some way. Now, I know what you're thinking, how the hell does one lose highly radioactive capsules that are like they're a set of car keys? Well, I'll answer that, as well as go through an example of each of the four scenarios to show you just how dangerous these tiny little things can be. In the 1980s, inside the country of Georgia, then still a part of the USSR, a series of radio relays were built to connect the existing hydroelectric dam to a second dam that was under construction. Now, since the area was sort of in the middle of nowhere and lacked sufficient electric infrastructure, the Soviets had bought eight RTGs with them. Each RTG contained a core of strontium-90 and contained some 1,300 terabecquerels of radioactivity, or in other words, a lot. However, before the dam could be finished, the USSR collapsed and Georgia became an independent country. As a result, the site of the dam, the radio relays, and the eight RTGs were simply abandoned. It is like that eight radioactive death traps were now lying somewhere in the Georgian woodlands. Two were discovered in 1998, along with a further two the following year. All four were contained without death, injury, or significant radiation exposure. But of course, anything that can go wrong, will go wrong, and it wouldn't be too long before some poor sods found this out. On the 2nd of December, 2001, three men from the village of Lea had driven into the woodlands near the dam site to search for firewood. Three men would later be labelled Patient 1, Patient 2, and Patient 3, so that's what I'll be referring to them as from now on. While searching, they discovered two strange canisters, around which the snow had melted and the ground was steaming. Patient 3 tried to pick one up, but immediately dropped it. It was too hot to touch. Now, these RTGs used to look something like this, however, by the time of the accident, they had fallen into a state of disrepair, and also possibly had been dismantled at some point. All that remains was the cores themselves. What's more, the cores were completely devoid of any labels sp spelling out the danger of the material inside. These men would have been completely oblivious to just how dangerous these tiny little cylinders were. The men also had another problem, one that probably seemed more important to them at the time, it was 6pm and it was getting dark and the weather was pretty awful. Deciding that it was too late and too dangerous to try and drive back home, and realising the apparent usefulness of these mysterious hot objects, they set up camp around the devices, using them as personal heaters. Patient 3 moved one source into place, while he and Patient 2 moved the other. They sat close to the sources and ate dinner, but were soon vomiting. Rather than realising that this was the first sign of acute radiation sickness, and perhaps ditching their strange heaters and going back home, they instead just assumed it was the vodka that they had been drinking. The vomiting was severe and lasted all through the night as the men slept around the devices with them facing their backs. It's believed patient 1 slept as close as 10 centimetres to one of them. The next day, patient 1 and 2, who hung the sources from their backs as they loaded the firewood into the truck, exhausted and sleep deprived, they only loaded half of it before, re uh, before heading back home. Thankfully, they left the sources behind. On December 4th, two days after the exposure, 
Patient 2 visited a local doctor. However, since he didn't tell the doctor about the mysterious devices in the forest, the treatment the doctor gave him did not do anything. By December 15th, Patient 1 and 2 had developed burns across their backs. Patient 1 also lost his voice. But again, neither sought care at this time. It ended up being the families of the three men who put two and two together and realised that all three men were falling ill with similar symptoms, having been in the same place together at the same time. They convinced them to, they were the ones who convinced them to seek treatment, and finally the three men were hospitalised on December 22nd, almost three weeks after exposure. The hospital concluded that all three men were suffering from acute radiation sickness. Patient 3's injuries were relatively mild, and as such he was discharged on January 23rd, 2002, after just over a month in hospital. The other two patients, however, remained in a serious condition. It became clear that they needed more treatment than their current hospital was able to provide. Patient 1 was sent to Moscow and patient 2 was sent to Paris. Patient 2 was hospitalised for over a year. He required extensive skin grafts but eventually recovered and was discharged on March 18th, 2003. Patient 1, however, would not be so lucky. His injuries persisted. Antibiotics and surgery seemingly did nothing. He had received the largest amount of radiation exposure on his back, where the wear on his back became evident by the appearance of a large radiation ulcer. He had also suffered damage to his vital organs. Even, sk even attempted skin grafts failed. He was simply too radioactive, as any new tissue just immediately died. His condition wasn't helped by an infection of tuberculosis, as well as his past of drug use. Death by radiation poisoning is often slow and drawn out, as well as excruciatingly painful. This was proven when patient 1 developed sepsis and then died of heart failure on May 13th, 2004, over three years after initial exposure. The common way to measure doses of absorbed radiation is known as the gray. A whole body dose of two grays comes with a 5% mortality rate. A dose of six grays comes with a 50% mortality rate. And a dose of 10 grays or more is considered to be lethal. Patient 3 suffered the smallest dose, between 1.2 and 2.3 grays. Patients 1 and 2 suffered similar doses of between 2.8 and 5.4 grays, and 3.3 and 5.7 grays, respectively. So why did patient 1 die despite suffering a survivable full-body dose, as well as a smaller dose than patient 2, who survived? Well, while his full-body dose may have been survivable, a localised dose of radiation may have been much higher. Remember, patient 1 had slept with his back a mere 10 centimetres from the radioactive source. So it's believed that he'd received a localised dose of between 21 and 37 greys to his shoulder. This is what most likely killed him. In the aftermath of the accident, the International Atomic Energy Agency successfully carried out a mission to contain and retrieve the orphan sources. They reported the accident chastised a lack of warning labels on the sources, as well as the abandonment of the sources in the first place. Between the collapse of the USSR in 2006, the IEEA had recovered some 300 orphan sources just from the country of Georgia. However, as I'm sure you remember, there were eight RTGs abandoned in the area surrounding Leah. Six, including the two involved in the accident, have been recovered. The other two, however, are still lost to this day. But what happens when accidents occur with nuclear weapons? The US military has a term for such events, broken arrow. It refers to any accidental event with nuclear weapons or their components that does not create a risk of nuclear war. This could be things like accidental detonation or damage to or loss of the weapon. The US Department of Defense has officially recognized 32 such incidents, although unofficially the Defense Threat Reduction Agency has detailed hundreds. Here are a few examples. On February 13th, 1950, a Convair B-36B carrying a Mark IV atomic bomb took off from Eelson Air Force Base in Alaska, headed for Fort Worth in Texas. However, cold weather was severely affecting the plane as ice buildup had already caused three of the six engines to die. His nuclear payload was jettisoned and detonated mid-air over British Columbia in Canada before the plane itself crash-landed nearby. Twelve of the seventeen on board were recovered alive, and Canadian authorities were never told that a plane had been carrying a nuclear weapon over their territory. On January 24, 1961, a B-52 bomber carrying two nuclear bombs broke up and crashed into a field near Goldsboro, North Carolina, killing three of the eight crew members. The bombs were jettisoned prior to impact. One bomb successfully deployed its parachute and landed in a field. The second one, however, had simply plummeted to the earth and smashed into the ground. Thankfully, neither bomb exploded. The government initially put out a statement that neither bomb was armed and therefore no explosion would have been possible anyway, 
However, declassified documents revealed in 2013 showed that this was a lie and that both bombers were in fact armed and the first one almost detonated, with three of its four ar army mechanisms firing. The first bomb was retrieved, however, much of the second one is still there to this day. Constant groundwater flooding made recovery difficult, so they simply removed the core, the dangerous bit, and left the rest buried in the ground. On March 11th, 1958, a nuclear bomb was mistakenly dropped on a small town in South Carolina. Fortunately, the fissile core was not installed, so a nuclear detonation wasn't possible. However, the bomb's conventional explosives still detonated, leaving a 70-foot-wide crater and injuring six people, as well as damaging several houses. The US government had to pay out $54,000 in compensation to the families of the town, which is over half a million dollars in today's money. A month earlier, two US aircraft collided just off the shores of the state of Georgia. One was carrying a Mark 14 atomic bomb. All crew members of both planes survived, however the bomb had been jettisoned to avoid a potential detonation in the event of a crash and it landed in the ocean. The nuclear bomb has never been found despite extensive searching. It's unknown if the bomb was a functional nuclear weapon or not, so if anyone watching this lives on the Georgia coast, you might have a nuke in your waters. And finally, on January 17th, 1966, a US B-52 bomber collided with its mid-air refueling tanker in the skies above the small fishing town of Palomares in Spain. All four crew members of the tanker were killed, as well as three of the seven bomber crew. More worryingly, the four nuclear bombs of the plane they were carrying probably fell near the town below. As this was now the mid-60s, the uh, more powerful thermonuclear bombs had now become ubiquitous. Three of the four bombs were found relatively quickly. The first had remained intact, however the conventional explosives of bomb two and three had detonated, resulting in plutonium contamination of the surrounding area. The fourth bomb, however, was, not, was lost for over ten weeks as it had landed in the ocean. Even today, nearly 60 years on, traces of the contamination can still be measured, with particularly highly lingering levels observed in snails, of all things. The accident did at least give rise to an amusing story, though. The US Navy had enlisted the help of a local Spanish fisherman who had claimed to have seen the bomb enter the ocean. Sure enough, it was where he said it was, and the bomb was retrieved. However, soon after, the fisherman and his lawyer threatened to sue the Department of Defense, claiming that the fisherman was entitled to a salvage reward under maritime law. The logic went as followed. Under maritime law, anyone who identifies missing property is entitled to a salvage reward, usually 1-2% to of the property's value, should the property be successfully recovered. And since the US government placed the value of the bomb at $2 billion, therefore the lawyer claimed his client was owed $20 million. They settled out of court, but apparently according to the fisherman, he never got his money. Since misplaced is kind of similar to lost, I thought I would use this chapter to highlight another way in which orphan sources can be very dangerous to the general public. The term evolutionary trap is used to refer to an evolved characteristic or behaviour that could be rendered detrimental by changes to an environment. Human beings are naturally curious and social creatures, but such attributes can be very bad when we come into contact with orphan sources and don't know what they are. In these instances, the natural human urge to touch and to share could easily get us killed. Sometime before March 1962, the 200 Giga Becquerel Cobalt 60 source from inside an industrial radiography device was left, unprotected, in the yard of a house by an engineer in Mexico City. A 10-year-old boy then stumbled across the store shortly after moving into the house on March 21st. The boy kept the source in his trouser pocket for several days. On April 1st, the boy's mother placed the source in the kitchen cabinet where it remained for over three and a half months promptly irradiating the entire house, and everyone in it. The 10-year-old boy died on April 29th, subsequently followed by his mother, who was six months pregnant at the time, on July 19th, his two-year-old sister on August 18th, and his grandmother on October 15th. The boy's father survived, presumably because he spent less time on average inside the house, but still received enough of a radiation dose to render him permanently sterile. In all, four people died of radiation poisoning because an engineer was either misplaced or couldn't be bothered to dispose of a radioactive source. On May 5th, 1978, in Algeria, a 920 gigabecquerel iridium-192 source fell out of the back of the truck during transport. Two children came across the source, obviously not knowing what it was, and took, uh, and took it. They kept it for several days before they gave it to their grandmother. She also obviously didn't know what it was. It was because she kept it in her kitchen for 38 days, and it was only removed when radiation was detected inside the house. The grandmother died of radiation poisoning, and six other family members received enough of a dose to cause injury. Seven casualties, 
caused by curious children wanting to give something pretty to their grandma. On March 19, 1984, in neighbouring Morocco, another Iridium-192 source, this one measuring 600 gigabecquerels, was misplaced and subsequently found by a labourer who took it home with him. He must have liked how it looked because he placed it on his bedside table, where it remained for several weeks. Eleven people were significantly irradiated, eight of whom died. And finally, in 1992, a Cobalt-60 source that had been used in a Chinese agricultural project was left in a well on a construction site. A worker from the construction site found the source on November 19th, 1992, and took it home with him. This resulted in the contamination of over 100 people and three deaths. One woman was exposed to a significant dose of radiation while nursing her sick husband. It's estimated that she received a dose of 2.3 grays. She was pregnant at the time. The baby was born with a birth rate of just 2 kilograms, and at the age of 16, the baby had an IQ of just 46. The mother would go on to suffer a premature ageing, and eight years after the accident, her second unborn child would die in utero. However, sometimes these sources of radiation are stolen, sometimes with disastrous consequences. This was shown in the city of Goiânia in Brazil in the autumn of 1987, but to give full context to the story, we have to go back a few years. In the early 1970s, a private radiotherapy institute opened in the city. In 1977, the institute purchased a new teletherapy device, which contained a 74 terabecquerel source of 93 grams of cesium-137, specifically a salt known as cesium chloride. In 1985, the institute moved to a new site, however, they didn't take the teletherapy device with them. It and the building were subsequently abandoned. Our story begins on the night of September 13, 1987 with the security guard for the abandoned site not showing up for work. Taking advantage of the situation, two men broke into the site looking for scrap metal. These men were Roberto dos Santos Alves and Wagner Pereira. Among these things they made off with was the assembly of the cesium 137, as they thought it might be worth something. Pereira in the following days began to fall ill with vomiting, dizziness, and diarrhoea, but a doctor that he went to just thought it must have been something he'd, that he'd eaten, and told him to just go home and rest. He soon developed radiation burns and would eventually lose the tips of some fingers. Alves, however, continued to work with the assembly, freeing the capsule and eventually cracking the aperture window, allowing some of the blue powder to spill out. Alves's prolonged exposure to the source would eventually lead to his entire right forearm having to be amputated. On September 18th, Alves sold the pieces of the assembly, capsule and powder included, to a local scrapyard owned by a friend of his, one Devaier Ferreira. That night, he noticed that the capsule was glowing, it was going blue. Believing that what was inside was valuable, or perhaps even supernatural, he immediately took it home to his family. They all took turns to marvel at the blue oddity, feeling it in their hands. A few days later, Devoyer's brother, Ivo, took some of the powder home to his family, where he spread it on the floor. His daughter was fascinated by the substance. She too played with it in her hands. She ate lunch while admiring how her hands were sparkling. She was vomiting within ten minutes. Many of the people who had come to see the powder simply went along with their lives afterwards, taking contamination with them. One of them was a bus driver, and so the contamination began to spread across the city like a disease. It was the wife of Devaier, one Maria Gabriella, who finally realised that a lot of the people that she knew were falling ill around the same time, all with similar symptoms, herself included. On September 28th, 15 days after the initial threat of the source, she gathered up what material of the source she could find and transported it to a hospital in a bag, telling them that it was killing her family. The hospital dismissed her and kept the bag on a chair in the courtyard of the building. They also called, called for a medical physicist to come and check out the bag. The following morning, the physicist arrived with a dosimeter to measure the levels of radiation. He decided to switch on the device before entering the building. The device immediately read the highest reading it could. It must be broken, he thought, as he went inside to get a second one. Hey, he turned down that one on. And the same thing happened again. A team of firefighters were just about to enter the building to retrieve the bag, but the physicists begged them not to go anywhere near the place, and he convinced authorities to take action, now that he was certain of the radioactive nature of the situation. And it was a good job he did that, because the firefighter was simply planning on picking the bag up and throwing it in the nearest river. Fortunately, once the real cause of the accident was identified, action from the state and local government was swift. 112,000 people were screened for potential contamination. 249 were found to be contaminated, and 20 were found to have been contaminated enough to require treatment for radiation poisoning. Of these, four died, 
Two men who were employees of Devayer's scrapyard, who had worked on the disassembly of the source, died on October 28th and October 27th after receiving whole body doses of 4.5 and 5.3 grays. They were aged 22 and 18. Maria Gabriella, wife of Devayer, died on October 23rd. She was 37. And finally, Evo's daughter died on the same day as her aunt after receiving a dose of six greys. She was six years old. Devayer Ferreira lost everything. His wife, his niece. His home had to be demolished. His irradiated pets had to be put down. And practically all of his possessions had to be bundled into drums and buried as nuclear waste. Devayer would die seven years after the accident in 1993 of liver cirrhosis, made worse by a severe depression and consequent heavy drinking. His brother, Evo, would die in 2003. Do you want to know what makes this story even more tragic? It was entirely avoidable. Four months before the accident, one of the owners of the Radiotherapy Institute had returned to the site to try and retrieve some things, including the teletherapy machine. However, a court-appointed police force stopped him from entering, as the building itself was still involved in a legal dispute with the state court. The man was driven away, but before he left, he warned them that they would, quote, be responsible for what would happen with the cesium bomb. End quote. And later records will show that the state court of Goyes knew that there was radioactive material inside the abandoned hospital for over a year before the accident happened, when two opportunistic thieves seeking scrap metal would inadvertently start the worst radiological disaster in South American history. While the government's response to the disaster may have been somewhat swift when it happened, it was their incompetence, combined with the human desire to share things, which allowed it to happen in the first place. A disaster that killed four people, indirectly killed one more, and scarred many others. This video shows just how dangerous radiation can be, like you need reminding. However, it is important to recognise that nuclear power and its derivative uses of things like medicine are generally safe when kept under watchful eyes of regulation. If there's something that I want you to take away from this video, it's Murphy's Law. Something that can go wrong, will go wrong. Well, that and... If you see a weird metal assembly lying in the woods, don't touch it. Just turn around and maybe tell someone.